Hello, welcome to the talk Behavior Driven Development and Testing of Qt and QML Application by Reginald Stadelbauer. Thank you. Thank you, and also welcome from my side uh, to this talk. Just a few words about myself. I'm Reginald, I'm co founder and CEO of FrogLogic. Um, before doing that, I worked as a software engineer at Trolltech, the company who originally invented Qt before it had a yeah, journey through different companies, now ending up in the Qt company. Um, and I've also been active um, in the KDE project, mostly in the K-Office project of that. So I'm coming from a software engineering background, basically. Um, before we get right into the topic of the talk, just a very quick introduction who FrogLogic is. So we are headquartered in, in Hamburg. We are in business uh, uh, for about 11 years. And we started the company originally to create an automated testing tool for Qt applications, or Qt applications, which is today the Squish GUI tester, which now also covers uh, uh, more than Qt, of course, also QML, and also some other technologies. And we also have a um, C, C++ and C Sharp code coverage tool in our portfolio, and are adding also QML coverage to that now. So that's um, basically our background. So we are um, doing a lot in the testing space, basically. And that's what um, led us, or also me, to look into um, what actually behavior-driven development and testing means, since that's a buzzword, which, uh, uh, or it seems like a buzzword, which is coming up more and more um, in agile development processes. Um, so um, we, we looked into that, what does it actually mean, and how ca can that be used in the real world? How can that be applied to Qt applications, QML applications? And that's what I want to talk about here today. So I will start with an um, introduction about what is meant when we talk about behavior-driven development and behavior-driven testing. With that, we also need to talk a bit about what is test-driven development, since those are um, uh, two terms um, uh, which kind of belong together. And uh, after that, um, um, I will uh, talk about how such behavior-driven tests can be automated, um, so everything can be run in an automated fashion uh, under this behavior-driven testing umbrella. And then I will conclude this talk with a live demonstration. I've prepared two demonstrations um, uh, with two different approaches of how um, a QML application can be tested in the behavior-driven um, way. So what is behavior-driven development, behavior-driven testing? When we look up the term on Wikipedia, we will find, um, uh, we'll find one article there with a definition of Dan North, who is considered the father of behavior-driven development and testing. And he says that BDD is a second generation, outside in, pull based, multiple stakeholder, multiple scale, high automation, agile methodology. Describes a cycle of interactions with well defined outputs, resulting in the delivery of working, tested software that matters. So, no matter how often I read that, I don't really fully understand what it shall mean. It's a kind of the sentence packed with as many passwords as possible, with as little content as possible. So let's try to look at that um, uh, in a different angle. If you also look uh, on that uh, uh, Wikipedia page further down, we can read that behavior-driven development and testing is based on the test-driven development approach. And that's already something which uh, one can grasp a bit better. What does test-driven development mean? It means instead of happily hacking away, implementing features, giving that to the customers, and then finding out somewhere down the road that something doesn't work, we um, turn around this process and first write a failing test for each feature. Then we implement the feature in our application, run the test until the test passes, and um, uh, once that's done, we can move on um, to the next step. And this is usually done on the unit testing level. So this means those um, uh, tests uh, initially failing, hopefully later on passing tests, are usually implemented as unit tests. So the testing is done with a very concrete knowledge of the, of the implementation of the application. We know about all um, implementation details, so it's uh, on a very inside-out approach. Um, we are not testing the application from a user's perspective, but more from a developer's perspective. And behavior-driven testing says it's the similar, or this, the goal is similar than test-driven development, but it wants to turn around this um, perspective um, which we are uh, uh, taking, which means instead of focusing on the implementation details, uh, instead of testing APIs, we rather want our tests 
to be on a much higher level and focus on the actual application's behavior. So the tests should not be written from a developer's perspective, but rather from a user's, end user's, or tester's perspective. And in order to do so, um, uh, such tests should not be um, written in some programming language, but instead described in a higher level, human readable, domain specific language. And in the behavior driven development testing space, the language Gherkin uh, kind of has been established as a de facto standard to define those tests or those feature definitions, um, uh, if we talk about it in a bit broader uh, sense. So that means that the tests can also not only be written by developers, but it's possible that anybody, anybody either the user, somebody, um, uh, some domain experts about the application, um, anybody who has uh, something to do with the application can define those tests since it's written in a human readable language. Of course, somebody has to still implement the actual logic of the test, but that's a different matter which we will cover in a moment. So all in all, this means Behavior-driven development testing is very similar to a test-driven development approach that we first test, then implement, but we focus much less on feature implementations and uh, describe our tests in this human-readable Gherkin language. So um, the files or these tests which we describe there are so-called feature files. They do not only um, uh, uh, serve as tests, but actually um, there are many purposes uh, for which these uh, um, feature definitions um, can be used. So first of all, it's a language in which we can describe um, the user story for the application, the feature specification. So we can describe very well uh, um, how certain features of the application um, should work, um, how the application should um, behave. With that, we have a clear communication uh, uh, with customers uh, from developers point of view with customers and users since we have one common language to talk um, to talk about what the application should do and the same this exactly same file and same description can then be used to document the acceptance test so we have a clear uh, definition of what the application has to do and we can use this exact um, definition of uh, steps to walk through for manual tests. And finally, the uh, same file serves as a storyboard for au automating those tests. So it's uh, one description which um, uh, serves several purposes. We will look at how a concrete example in a moment to make it a bit better understandable. I understand that it's, it's very high level at the moment. So just uh, one recap why we want to do behavior-driven development. It's the test-first approach on a higher level compared to, um, uh, to uh, uh, the plain test-driven development. We clearly separate the test logic from the implementation, so we have a domain-specific language for the test logic, and we have then um, a kind of hidden implementation which does the real work. And with that, we allow also non-programmers to participate in defining features and tests in one common format. And all in all, it, me it means we have a single language to communicate, so there are less misunderstandings of what users expect and what developers do. So now to a concrete example. For this um, talk, um, I um, developed a um, QML-based unit uh, test, uh, uh, unit conversion tool. Um, so it's a very simple application. You can enter a number, you can choose a unit to convert from, you can choose a unit to convert to, and press the convert button, which should then uh, display the result in a two field. Or if we choose um, mismatching units, for example, trying to convert meters in kilograms, which doesn't work, uh, we should get an error displayed in the tool field and the error message with more details, such as that the length and uh, weight are not uh, compatible or a mismatch, should be displayed in red. So this is my application, and now I've described in my own words how this application should behave for these two cases, and now we can go ahead and implement or write such a Gherkin file um, which defines that feature in, uh, in this Gherkin language. So basically, we have the feature of a valid conversion with the scenario of converting meters into centimeters, and then we have this 
Gherkin specific steps, as they're called, um, uh, test steps, that given that the unit converter is running, so the vocation has to run, of course, when or enter a specific number and choose to convert from meters and choose to convert to centimeters and click convert, then um, uh, the result should be displayed in the result field. So that's now a so-called feature file in the Gherkin syntax, which is used for specifying what the application should do for manual tests and which then also will be used um, for defining the, uh, the logic for the automated tests. And just for completeness, um, the, the feature of the invalid conversion, that was the second screenshot I've shown, um, where we mix units, so it's pretty much the same, just that we sh choose um, a different units and after clicking convert, um, we expect um, an error to be displayed and the um, uh, error message of the length uh, versus weight mismatch displayed in red in the dialog. So that, that's also, again, such a feature file. So these are the feature files which someone would write first and uh, then we would go from there. So this means the process of behavior-driven development and testing is also in that sense very similar to test-driven development. We first write a initially, of course, failing um, feature test or feature file. Then very simply said, we make that feature test pass and that's um, the high-level process. Of course, to make that feature test pass, we need to implement or refactor code in the application. We also need to implement some test logic behind um, uh, the feature test. I'll talk about that uh, when we talk about automating. So then we run the test and do that until this feature test passes. So that's the overall process of um, the behavior-driven development approach. And the testing can, of course, be done manually. So somebody just opens up that feature file, walks through that step-by-step, -step, in parallel opens the application, executes the steps there, and verifies that everything which is written in this feature file um, is compliant to what the application does, or if it's not the case, log a failure for the test for a developer to look into. Or, ideally, one would like to automate such a test, and that leads us to the second part of this talk of automating a behavior-driven test. So what, what are the requirements when we want to automate a behavior-driven test? Um, we need a bit more than just a testing framework which, which works with the application. So first of all, we need a behavior-driven testing framework. What exactly that should do, we will see in the following slides. But then, of course, we still need some testing framework which is able to interact with the application which we want to test. Um, just having that feature file doesn't give us much yet. We still need to somehow click on some buttons, somehow uh, read values from the user interface to do verifications. So um, we still need to implement the test logic in some way. Can be done still on the unit testing level, can be done in a GUI testing level. If we test some networking application, maybe on the protocol level. So uh, depending on the application type, uh, um, we would need a different testing framework to interface with the application. And then we need, of course, a glue between those so that the behavior-driven testing framework, which kind of parses and inter interprets these feature files, can call into the testing framework, ask that to in, uh, do certain interactions on the application and report the results back. So in more details, the behavior-driven testing framework, as first step, needs to be able to generate skeletons. So now we assume we have such a feature file and the next step to implement an automated behavior-driven test is to take this feature file and generate um, a, a step definition skeleton um, in our preferred language in which we want to implement the test logic. So um, this means we have this feature file here um, uh, which describes a feature which we have looked at before. Then we run um, some kind of uh, generation tool and this will generate, for example, if you choose Python as our script language, uh, would generate an, a skeleton file which implements one function for each step. And then in Python, for example, we can use the annotation feature to map a certain step to a certain function so that when we later run this test, the uh, behavior-driven testing framework can do the mapping from one step to one script function, executes the script function for each step, and logs the result back. So then. The next uh, feature is to run such feature files, which again means it needs to parse the feature files and then executes the feature file by mapping, as I said, each feature to a step definition function, which by then should obviously be implemented and do some reporting. So it means, in, in a sense, it executes this um, 
uh, script functions, which we have first generated and then implemented. Um, then we run the test, and then in the end, we would get a report where, for example, in the feature file, um, each um, um, step, each feature, each scenario is highlighted in green or red, depending whether that passed or failed. So that's the idea behind automating um, such uh, uh, behavior-driven tests um, uh, to have a clear separation between the test uh, logic, which is a feature file, test implementation, which can be in some script language, and have a tool which executes that. But in order to really implement those test steps, so uh, here I only have the square brackets with the dots, some implementation is missing there. Um, we need a testing framework which can interact with the application which we want to test. So um, either if you do it in the unit testing level, it needs to be able to uh, support the programming language of our application um, to call APIs of it, or if you want to do it on UI level, we need a testing tool which supports the use interface technology such as QD or QML for the automation or to identify objects, click on buttons, do verifications. And then in order to do this integration so that uh, these uh, step um, definition functions can call the testing tool, some kind of scripting supports or other integration options are needed so that those two testing frameworks can work together. And then of course, it's always good to have some convenient tooling for test creation, maintenance, debugging to make the life of the test implementer or test engineer easier. So that means um, we would take this, um, uh, if we take this example from before, we would uh, uh, um, have this uh, implementation file and each step now would be implemented. For example, the first step to start the application, the second step to click on some field and type in some text. So, and these functions would be executed by the actual testing framework which can interface with the application or test. So with that, um, we have basically uh, closed the loop to integrate a behavior-driven testing framework with the actual testing framework which interacts with the application. So in summary, they need to somehow talk the same language so that those step definitions can call the testing framework. There needs to be some common reporting so the results which come from the testing framework are sent back to the behavior-driven testing framework. And of course, there are always problems, so it's good if these tools work together in some way to offer the needed debugging facilities. Now there exists a wide range of frameworks uh, which one can choose from. If you look at behavior-driven testing frameworks, the, probably the most um, uh, yeah, the most uh, well-known one, the most prominent one is the Cucumber framework out there, but there are several others like the JBehave and Behave, SpecFlow um, for uh, C-sharp, R-spec, Lettuce, and uh, in our Squish GUI tester, we've also implemented native behavior-driven testing support now with all the features to generate skeletons and execute um, Gherkin files. Unit testing frameworks, if you want to implement the logic using unit testing frameworks, there obviously is also a wide choice here in the Qt and QML world, um, uh, obviously a Qt Testlib and a Qt uh, Quick Test um, uh, uh, tools would be the most suitable ones, but depending on the needs, some others might be work as well. GUI testing frameworks, there also exist several ones, of course also our own Squish GUI tester, but also a lot of other commercial or free ones. Um, so it always depends really on the specific application you want to automate, which tools um, work best and how you can integrate those. So with that, um, I'm done with all the theory. So let's now get to the practice to see how that um, can work in a real world example. So um, that's the wrong, that's first example. That's uh, uh, what I want to do is um, on the non-GUI level. So I actually want to test the back end of this unit converter, which um, I've implemented in uh, QML. So um, as, as first uh, step, we will look at the feature file. So I've just written a feature file which um, defines um, the feature of a, con a converter for various units. Um, I have two scenarios in there, the initial state of the converter, when a converter, so the backend object of the converter is created, I expect the default units to be in meters and a simple conversion when a converter is created and they enter 100 meter and kilometer as target units and expect the result to be 0.1 kilometers. So that would be the um, plain feature file. 
Then we have written in um, QML JavaScript um, um, a parser for that, um, a generator for that. So I have here, I have here this parser which can parse the um, uh, can parse the um, uh, uh, feature files with a generator which can parse that and will generate a JavaScript file um, and a Qt Quick test out of that. So we can then run this test through the Qt Quick uh, test framework. So we'll just uh, do that. Um, I will run this uh, this uh, generator QML with the sample demo, demo feature file, and that, that now generates for me the sample demo JS file and this uh, uh, Qt Quick test sample demo QML file. So we can just uh, look at those. So here we have now this um, uh, uh, feature or this step skeleton generated. So we have basically for each when, for each then step, with the exact uh, step um, content, we have an empty implementation. So the next step would be to implement those. And that part I did not want to do live here. So um, I have a uh, big surprise um, prepared that um, here. So that's how it would look like in the end when it's implemented. As said, I'm utilizing the Qt Quick test framework here. So I get those test compare functions and so on uh, from that framework. So that when I run the test through the Qt Quick test um, uh, runner, um, I, I will uh, get the results in a nice report. So in addition to that, this um, uh, test uh, converter, oops, no, that's the wrong file. Here, this uh, test has been generated, which basically just executes um, uh, the feature uh, file. So then I can run all of that, and then it runs all tests in my directory. So both the, one, the empty one I generated, that's where we get all those implement calls from, and then the one I prepared, where we get the proper results from the implementations. So that's um, um, yeah, a very simple implementation of the behavior-driven testing approach where we started with a feature file um, and then um, uh, basically implemented that uh, by generating a skeleton first and then running the, uh, the implementation through the QML test runner and get the reporting in that format. So you could then uh, generate XUnit or whatever to integrate that into Jenkins or what, what you like. So that was one um, yeah, simple implementation. Then I would also like to show you um, the implementation we have done in our Squish uh, GUI tester. So there um, uh, we will now do the test level on the user interface of the QML, uh, con uh, of the um, unit converter application, um, and, but also again start by creating new tests with and just writing the new um, and empty uh, feature file. So I'm creating a new, um, I'm creating a new test suite. I want to create a behavior-driven development test. I want to test a Qt application. Let's do the scripting in JavaScript. Then I choose the application I want to automate. So it's just a small shell script which starts the uh, unit converter through the um, uh, QML uh, uh, scene application. And now we create a convert test. And now we need to go ahead and write um, the feature file. So I will just take that out um, of the, uh, oops, where, where am I? I will just take that out of the presentation basically. So I don't have to write all of that by hand. So now we have here, um, I've copied this uh, feature file from the presentation in here. I see, I get already the warning symbols here that no implementation has been found for those steps yet. So we can just try running it. What will happen? Not much, everything will be read. And it tells me in the detailed report also that um, none of this step um, could be executed because no step definition was found. So the next step would be um, to um, uh, create the missing step implementations. So I, I do that, and now all the um, implementations in JavaScript, since that's what I chose this language, are being generated, each implementation just with a test warning. So um, we can now run it, so now it will not be red anymore, but we will instead get warnings here, which has different color. So now the next step is to go ahead and start implementing those steps. So we can just uh, go in here and record a first snippet, which just starts up the unit converter. Um, and for example, we want to verify that the window title is correct to check that the correct window is open. Uh, 
and end the recording. So now we get here the start application. We are waiting for this um, uh, window to appear and check that the title should be um, the QML unit converter, and we can remove the warning. And now let's just implement the remaining steps. So I'm just setting a breakpoint on each in each function, and now I will just run this test, and on each breakpoint I will do a quick recording for the specific step to basically fill in the steps with some implementation. So now um, we need to enter 378.9, uh, and I can again start a recording. 378.9. And end that recording, continue the execution to the next step. So here we should click on meters. And continue. Then click on centimeters. And continue and click on convert. And finally, continue to the last step, and there we should do a verification that the correct result is displayed. So we'll just verify this field and the text of it. And after that, the implementations, oops, did some, it's, after that, the implementations are inserted here. We can just remove the warnings and clean up the script a bit. So we don't care where we click into the bu uh, button. So we just remove that stuff here. So now we have a complete. Oh, there's still a warning. Let's remove that. So now we have com a complete implementation of our um, of our steps. Now we can run that feature file again. Now it should execute a test. And now we see everything is in green. So um, the test uh, worked as expected, just to see how a failure looked like. Let's, uh, um, for example, comment one line out. Um, so we select a wrong unit, basically run the test, and see what's happening. Now we got a, a failure here. And because the result is incorrect, and that also flags the scenario and the feature to be a, a fail, and therefore it's then um, uh, visible that some problem is in this test, and this needs to be debugged. So these are just uh, the basic, the simple features of behavior-driven testing. But when you look at that script, um, it's uh, quite easy to see that one obviously um, wants to make those steps a bit more generic. So for example, this vendor enter should not have a hard-coded number in there, um, and choose to convert from and to should also be able to uh, have a parameter uh, passed to specify the unit. So we can basically run uh, different tests or different set of tests with the same feature file. And that's something which the Gherkin language in all the behavior-driven testing frameworks which exists also supports. So if we again go back to the implementation, um, we can look at those steps, and there exists uh, um, a regular expression and wildcard um, syntax in those um, uh, step text, basically, which allows to uh, mark certain parts as, as variables to match a number, a word, or anything. And that's what we will do here. So I will just write in here any. And then in the order of how you put those um, placeholders in there, these will be parsed and put as variables into the function call. So I can um, say a value and then here replace it with value. And so on. So um, with that, let's just um, for completeness um, real quick also implement the, um, the second feature file. Oops. And what we see here is that a lot of steps can be reused. What we also see nicely um, is that uh, some of them are um, not implemented yet. So um, uh, we could, for example, change this choose to convert to uh, kilogram and to centimeters. That should be also a variable one. So let's um, um, just also use the same wildcard um, logic here. Oops. 
and then we just need to do um, so if you want to learn more about how that exactly works in Squish, I can tell you about that later the booth. That's not the topic of this talk here now. So that so this way we basically call the button by by unit, so we dynamically make a button lookup of the button which matches the unit. And with that, unless, okay, I made some error in here. Oh. Okay. Now it should be correct. And now we see that this convert to kilogram um, magically also is marked as implemented and uh, that way um, we could go on and now do the same for the error message but I won't repeat all of that here um, to spare you of watching me um, implementing that. So instead of that I will now switch to a prepared test case of the same scenario. So what uh, would be nice um, in in addition to that is uh, uh, when we have all of that in a very generic manner where we can pass in, in variables to make such a test data-driven, for example. That's also a standard feature of the Gherkin language, which most uh, data-driven uh, testing frameworks implement. Um, and uh, uh, this is called in Gherkin um, so-called um, scenario outlines. So it's very similar to the feature file we have seen before, uh, just that we do many valid conversions. And then we have, uh, instead of scenario, with an outline. So that's basically the template to run for each record in our data set. And then instead of the hard coded values, we use these um, variables, which are read from a table, which is specified under examples, as it is called. So basically here we can uh, define a set of um, records to run um, this test with, and we'll run all those steps for each test. And we can just run this test uh, real quick as well. Now everything passed, but now let's just uh, change some value here to something incorrect to trigger a failure. And that's a nice thing that um, we actually then get also highlighted in which record this, uh, this error happened. So with this reporting directly in the feature file, instead of having a separated report, which just pa logs some passes and, may, uh, and fails, um, we have, it's quite easy to um, understand um, uh, where is the problem and debug it from there. So with that, I'm, yeah, as usual, rather quick with my talk, um, just as a quick conclusion. So um, behavior-driven testing, it sounds a lot like a buzzword, but um, we, we see it really being used a lot. That's also why we implemented native support in our testing tool for that. And the really nice thing about it, it's, a, it's no big magic. I mean, it's really just an, a, an abstraction enforced between test logic and test implementation. But exactly that enforcement um, forces people to um, um, think a bit uh, cleaner about their tests, design them cleaner, and, not, uh, and uh, uh, that way um, create much more robust tests. It's a bit more work to create those tests, obviously, than just recording them, but the end result is usually much more stable and uh, can be reused for a much longer time. And for free, you get a nice specification of what your um, application should do. So our conclusion on the topic is that it's, it is really more than a buzzword. It's something which can be used in, in, real, in the real world and what we also see being used uh, at many of our customers in the real world. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Well, I have uh, two questions. The first question is about the uh, Squish EDA. Could yeah. you please show that on a screen? In the lower dock, it looks like test case turned out fine while it's green. But yes, that's a known bug. It's, oh, okay. it's a development <laughs> version I'm using here. So okay. that's not. Re yeah, I should uh, say that um, this is not released yet. So that's our upcoming 5.2. But that, that's no. I just didn't get the, fax, the bug fix in time for this talk anymore. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, the last question is: um, 
can this be run from command line as well? Yes. yes. And does the can the output be uh, interpreted by a Jenkins server? Yes. Or? Yes. So you can run it from the command line. There are Jenkins plugins, and you also get a nice report of the feature file. Or if you do it without feature files, you get a report in in Jenkins. So that's <laughs> all possible. Yes. Thank you very much. Yep. Hi, we can see here a uh, highlighted text in Gherkin file, which is kind of report for me as a developer. Uh, the question is, is it possible to have some summary report for the end customer, like a test suite, not a test case? Uh, yes, so that's when you run from the command line, you get a HTML report which contains a high level summary and then you can drill down into the details of that. Uh, I have a question. Um, you're using indentation here on the Gherkin language. Is it yes. just f uh, for having nicer syntax, but it's not yes. required? It's, it's not like Python, so you can do it okay. as you like, but for a nicer syntax. Um, um, the other question is, I mean, second of all, very much, it's a very nice talk. And we are using also BDD driven development in automotive and large systems, actually, nowadays. Um, yeah. One thing which I really missed a little bit on the talk was, the real benefits of driven by user stories. So we are developing according to user stories, and then yeah. you can attach those tests on the user stories, which is a really big benefit. Uh, we have this UI user interface specification people, they write the test for us, together with, with us, and then yeah. from there we can start to kind of implementing those tests. Yeah, okay, I, I, I tried to say that at the beginning, so that yeah. it's the communication with the user and this basically the user can define the story and it's not uh, and you have a common language to mm -hmm. communicate there um, yeah. another thing is that um, I miss a little bit there's a plugin for Jira missing currently where we can because all user stories are in Jira and we would like to add to X to user story um, those feature files one okay. by one and then yeah. have just um, a squish tool just pull it out of Jira okay. yeah. And, and to run it all the time, so that our users, which don't really know how to write a text file or with a mm -hmm. Git repository, can directly use it from inside yeah. Jira. It would be great. Yeah. So, so the, the file structure is very open to, in the next step, allow exactly such things that the feature files come from somewhere outside, so it's really just a text file, mm -hmm. so that some links can be made. So that's in our mind, but not there yet. Okay. There's one at the front here. Good morning. How do you um, take care of different um, wordings or different sentences that mean essentially the same? The, yeah. the same? That's, um, uh, if that you have a large test suite, it would yeah. be difficult to... Um, that, that's indeed, a, um, I would say, the biggest challenge of behavior-driven testing, to find a kind of standardized language and also to find the granularity of what you, uh, how detailed are the steps or what is basically hidden in the test implementation. So that's indeed something where you have to develop somehow a uh, yeah, style guide for the wordings or something. We, uh, the next, uh, uh, partially we have to write the next thing here is that we also offer completion. So that when you start typing something, you see there is already something which might be what you want so you can complete upon already existing steps. But it is indeed a problem that um, it might happen in larger test suites uh, that uh, they only find out later that the same thing is called differently twice. So there's no, no, no one recipe for that, unfortunately. Hello. Um, just one, uh, one question. Uh, we uh, work a lot with the UML uh, to specify especially the, uh, the behavior, use cases, uh, stuff, uh, requirements, and then we, uh, we just... Uh, uh, derive the the test cases from from our use cases basically, okay. and uh, do you do you have any uh, any interaction with UML or how to to link something? Because there's one uh, one thing that uh, uh, is really important for our customers is to um, to have the traceability uh, between specification till the test uh, all, all the way yeah. down. So uh, I, I'm trying to imagine to use your tool, yeah. but it would be a pain, I guess, uh, unless you have uh, some, some... So we, we have nothing uh, ready there or uh, really thought about that. But what we thought about is that Gherkin is not the only language there which we want to support. So we basically have abstracted the parser away which parses some kind of, of 
of steps and uh, puts that in, into some object model which executes it and then gives the results back. So it is technically possible to write um, some different parts if some different format exists which works in a similar manner that steps are defined and you want to basically have connection between steps and script functions. So technically it's possible um, to do that from design. Okay, thank you. Uh, when will uh, 5.2 uh, version of Squish be released? We hope by the end of this year. Thanks a lot for your attention. If there's anything else, you can come over.